Hey y'all, in today's video I wanted to talk about async optimizations. So let's start with the first optimization that Microsoft did by introducing value task. So for some time Microsoft has been uh, introducing some more optimized counterparts to uh, class types uh, by making their uh, struct counterparts and adding the value prefix to them. So value tuples, value tasks. Uh, you might have seen them, you might have used them, but maybe you don't know exactly how they work. So in principle, uh, value types are not passed uh, by the reference, but uh, by their value. So if they are small enough, it's actually faster to pass them by, by their value because you don't have to reach out to the register and see what's the actual value and stuff like that. Uh, I won't get into the specifics of this uh, in this video, but uh, hopefully I'll touch on it in later videos. But uh, you have to know that in general, they may work faster if the actual value they are encapsulating is small. So for big values, it may actually be slower. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so what is a value task? It's a, a, it represents an operation that may be synchronous, but may uh, complete asynchronously as well. So as opposed to tasks, they are optimized for both scenarios or actually even more for the synchronous scenario. Uh, and they produce no allocation on synchronous result, uh, but they have their drawbacks. So they cannot be awaited more than once or they cannot be used in concurrent scenarios because they are reused under the hood by uh, .NET. So uh, if anything of those two is applicable, value task is out of the question. And task also has some more benefits to it. So it has larger API, so it has the when any, when all, it can yield, and it also can uh, block wait. So if you desire, you can wait for your task synchronously if, uh, when working with tasks. And they can be, of course, awaited more than once and uh, be used in concurrent scenarios. So value tasks uh, will never uh, be uh, applicable in those scenarios, but that's by design. They are supposed to be small and they are supposed to be fast. So by finding out what is a value task and how it compares to task, uh, we can jump into the meat of this uh, video, uh, how to optimize your async calls. So yeah, uh, async and await optimizations. Uh, some of those I've already touched on previous videos, but let's uh, reiterate. Uh, first of all, uh, task, uh, cache your tasks whenever possible, so sometimes this is applicable. Uh, if you don't have to query something twice, do not do that, uh, just uh, cache. I know that it's kind of general, but it is applicable and I think it's uh, uh, general enough that it might also uh, help someone. The next point is to never use async without the await. So I prefer to use the task completed task or task from result, depending on if you're returning something or you're just marking that the operation was complete. Uh, it's uh, It won't initiate the uh, async state machine. Uh, I've talked about it in the previous video as well. So if you want to uh, see more about this, uh, jump to that video, I'll have it linked. And uh, apply value tasks for scenarios where synchronous returns are possible. And I'll touch on that uh, in the next slide. Uh, of course, uh, the next point is to use uh, tasks when all when awaiting multiple tasks that can be awaited in parallel. Uh, yeah. And uh, the next point is to use cancellation token. So do not waste your computational power. Uh, when the user actually declines their request. And the last point is the async aligning. So what is async aligning? So let's suppose we have this scenario where we uh, have an async method that we provide some value to. And if that value is uh, uh, smaller than zero, we just return zero. And in the other case, we perform some internal logic as shown here. Uh, what actually happens is that when we provide the value smaller than zero, we have to create the async state machine for it, even though we won't actually use it because we need to create the task and uh, fake all the whole thing just to create the task of int for it. And that's uh, uh, actually very slow for this synchronous scenario. And uh, for the asynchronous scenario, even though you might seem that this whole thing returns uh, one task, it uh, awaits uh, your piece of logic that you have in the get something internal and then then once it's completed it creates a new task for the caller to await on so uh, actually what happens is here we create one task that we await and when the caller uh, calls this method he creates a second task 
so uh, what happens is that uh, if you call the get something to async, you create uh, you actually create two states machines for it because you have to await this one as as well as this one. So how can we improve it? Uh, we can remove the async and await keywords and return the task directly. So because of the fact that we don't you need to use uh, the internal logic uh, code or return type uh, in this method, we actually can pass on the task to the caller uh, without creating a new one. So this task will be passed on to the caller. So it returns the same task here. Uh, it's only applicable in scenarios where we don't actually need to uh, do anything with the awaited value because uh, if uh, such scenario would be present, uh, you would have to actually await it here, create the task and then uh, perform some sort of logic here. Uh, and then uh, the caller would actually need to await a new task, so it would uh, create two tasks. But it's pretty common scenario where we just uh, perform some validation and then uh, jump into the task await async uh, state machine uh, down the line. So uh, now that we know what the async and await uh, aligning does, let's see uh, what are the pitfalls, what are the upsides and downsides. So as I've shown, it's applicable for scenarios with one await, that is the last operation of a method. Uh, it can be more uh, as awaits if you use the task when all or when any operator. So as you saw, uh, async aligning helps us remove additional tasks in our code, so therefore it uh, removes some allocations and uh, produces faster code. But uh, there are some catches to async aligning. It cannot be used within using statements and try-catch statements. Uh, so you, you have to be aware of that and you have to keep track of that. So let's see how it looks in the example. So I have uh, two async methods. One uses uh, async aligning and one does not. And the internal piece of logic that they both call uh, throws an exception. So as you can see, uh, I try to catch that exception in this method and let's see how it looks like. Uh, so the first one is the non-async aligning method, so let's just see how it behaves. It uh, tries to call the internal logic, it goes there, it uh, catches the exception and uh, writes uh, to me that it caught the exception and that's, that's that. But now we go on, on to the aligning ex uh, exception handling uh, piece of logic and uh, when we go into it, as you can see, the exception is thrown because the task gets passed down and it uh, cannot uh, be uh, cut from here because the actual piece of logic is not executed here. It will be executed only once we await it. So uh, because of the fact that we have only one task, uh, it will be uh, awaited uh, on the actual await uh, statement. So the piece of uh, logic with the handling uh, needs to be here. So it's something that you just need to observe yourself if that's something that you can do, if you can move this validation logic here or you cannot. Uh, async lighting is somewhat uh, complicated uh, with try-catch statements, so maybe it's easier just to uh, await your statements uh, or if you plan on uh, catching any exceptions and or using statements because once you have the using statement uh, and uh, you return the task directly without awaiting it, uh, you dispose of the object by executing the last uh, uh, line of the using statement and once you actually await the thing that you was supposed to use something, uh, the using is just disposed of. And the last point to async colliding is that the exception handling logic needs to be adjusted if present. So as you saw, you, it cannot be used inside try-catch statements, but the outside exception handling is also uh, changed. So let's suppose that we have two methods, uh, get something and get something colliding, and the, they both call the internal uh, method that uh, throws an exception but we await them uh, only later. So we first get the tasks uh, for the normal one and the aligning one uh, and await them later and let's see what happens. Uh, they get something async uh, checks for something and then uh, wants to get something internally but it's the await statement and we haven't awaited anything so it just returns the tasks for us and uh, get something aligning will go check something and will actually execute 
uh, the code internally because there's no await here it will actually perform anything up to the first await here as well so you can think about this aligning tasks as squashed tasks so treat them as a one piece of code so uh, as as you would have uh, just uh, copied this code and pasted it here it will execute anything up to the first await here so with all of that i think we can answer the question how to optimize your asynchronous method i've built this little chart here to help you answer that uh, my first question is, does your method really need to be asynchronous? <laughs> and it might sound stupid, but sometimes you just over-engineer some stuff and you think that something will be asynchronous later down the line, but it's actually not. So then you can just convert to synchronous method and uh, keep it simple. Uh, if it's not applicable, I check if I can async a light. So if there's some tasks that are just uh, uh, awaiting for something else because they are just passing down something else uh, from some other layer, then I just async alight it. Uh, you know, you, you have to be aware that uh, there's there cannot be any exception handling there or any using statements. So it's uh, up to your taste and you, you need to look on the case by case basis. But if it's applicable, I just async align it. And the other case is that uh, I have something that returns synchronously, maybe half the time, maybe even more, because value tasks are slower when they are asynchronous than tasks, because they are uh, a struct that needs to also create a class for it, because under the hood, they use tasks for asynchronous methods. So uh, you just need to be sure that the uh, value tasks are applicable to your scenario. Uh, but I think that uh, when you are applying them, you still need to benchmark it uh, to check if it made any progress, if it uh, made the improvement that you were hoping for. And if not, uh, I just keep it async task. So then I just look for other possibilities of optimization uh, and yeah. I hope that this video helped you to learn uh, what is asynchronous aligning, uh, how value tasks work and uh, how can you optimize your async calls. And with that, thank you for watching.